Today we're looking at I'm the resurrection and the life. We've been talking about the I am statements of Jesus from the book of John, from the gospel according to John, and uh, that all began July, June 30th with the question, who is this man? And we're continuing that process uh, with John chapter 11 today, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, I've got a, a personal concern that I need to insert at this point. When we talk about resurrection and we look at the story of Lazarus, we're talking about a grave, we're talking about death, we're talking about grief. And all those things can be overwhelming if you have just lost somebody you love. And maybe not just. If, if there's a void in your life from somebody you love having passed on, I don't want this message today to take the scabs off your wounds. I don't want it to, to bring fresh pain to you. And so I'm going to pray right now that his wonderful peace will overwhelm you. And he will flow with healing power in your spirit right now. So as we pray over this message, would you just join with me? And if, if there's that kind of void in your life, would you just hold your hands out before the Lord? Father, I miss Dad. I miss Mom. I miss my sister. And there's so many across this place that have lost children, have lost parents, have lost spouses, have lost people they love, friends they cared for. Father, I pray that in these moments there will be a healing and a filling with the voids. That there will be no freshened wounds, but you will have glory and praise, and that your spirit will flow through us as we share the word together. And we will grow with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. During our early years of missionary service, my mom and dad always met our flights. And they always took us to the airport. Normally it was to Dulles International, outside of Washington. But there was one day, somebody else drove. My dad no longer could drive a car. But mom and dad went to the airport in the car with us. I told them, don't come in. You know, just, we'll say goodbye right here at the car. My dad held me. He said, son, you know, I've always met your plane, but Next time you come, I won't be here. But when you clear customs in heaven, I'll be waiting and arrives. You see, he believed in the one who said, I'm the resurrection and the life. A few months later, we were on vacation in South Africa, stopped overnight in Johannesburg on our way back north. Late that night, a call came from my brother. My dad had passed on. We quickly made arrangements to return to Virginia for the funeral and to be with my mother for a few weeks. Hundreds of people came to offer their condolences. My brother and I got tired of hearing people say how very sorry they were for us and commenting about what a good man he was. Well, they meant well. It was culturally appropriate, and it was very kind, but I finally stopped one of Dad's old friends, and I asked the question. I said, if you got the news that the Queen of England had given my father a knighthood, would you say sorry? I said, of course not. I said, you'd say congratulations, right? He said, yes. I says, well, he has just been crowned by the King of Kings. And he's been ushered in the throne room of God, and God himself has said, good job. Well done, whatever. I said, so stop it with sorry, and let's hear some congratulations, and let's celebrate a life well lived. You see, he's still a good man. He simply moved to a nicer neighborhood. 
So let's look this morning at John chapter 11. And consider the event of Jesus making this profound and confrontational statement. As long as we've, as, as along, all along as we've worked our way through the Gospel of John, we've watched the conflict build between Jesus and the religious leaders. And here in chapter 11, we see the decision made and the die cast to terminate the life of the Son of God. John 11, verse 1. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. Now remember, John is writing this many, many years later. This event actually happens later in the story, but he is reminding his leaders who it is he's talking about because they knew the story of the perfume and the, the hair on the feet and all of that. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, the sickness will not end in death. No, it's for God's glory so, the son, so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you're going back? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they will see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, and I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let's, uh, let us also go that we may die with him. Now, he wasn't talking about dying with Lazarus. He thinks, they think Jesus is going to get stoned in the process. And he said, well, you know, if he's going to die, we might as well die too. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. And many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And I know that even, but I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again at the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe you're the Messiah, the Son of God who's come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher's here, she said. He's asking for you. Mary heard this. She got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he that op who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? 
Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor. He's been in there for four days. Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, Jesus called on a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with the strips of linen and the cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Hmm. What an event. Today we're not going to take a lot of time, get into a lot of conjecture regarding the friendship between Lazarus and, the fa and his family and Jesus. But this is the only place in the entire narrative of the four Gospels where someone is both referred to by name and identified as a friend to Jesus. In fact, I get the impression that Jesus was a comfortable guest in their home, possibly saw their place in Bethany as a quiet retreat from the religious bustle of Jerusalem just a few kilometers away, little more than a distance, little more than the distance from my home in Bicocini to here in this place where we are gathered on the Mississippi Peninsula. You know, I have friends like that who if they ever find, found out that I had been to their city and had chosen to stay in a hotel room for the night rather than to have stayed with them, I would have some serious explaining to do and I would miss out on some wonderful fellowship. In fact, the, the uh, end of the month, I will, Merle and I will drive to their home in North Carolina. I'm leaving here next Sunday night after after the Sunday service on Sunday morning and going for a couple of weeks. But two weeks, from today, two weeks from yesterday, we will drive to their home and spend the night. I'm looking forward to some incredible fellowship, a comfortable place to sleep, time with great friends, some good food. Then on Sunday, we'll go together with them to the church where I'll be speaking. But their home is always open. When other people visit them, when other missionaries visit them, they identify that room upstairs as Bob and Merle's room. And uh, so a whole lot of people know that they've slept in Bob's bed. And uh, I only get there every couple of years, but you know, it's that kind of relationship. I think that's kind of like what Jesus might have had with Lazarus and his family. That kind of a, a knowing that was his place to stay whenever he came through town. But let's get back to the story. The thing that must have amazed everyone that was when the news came that Lazarus was ill, Jesus did not drop everything and run to Bethany to heal his friend. After all, he was able. And a broken-hearted Martha meets him on the road outside of town and lets him know that he had let her down. He could have helped. He could have healed her brother. But he had not come. When they needed him so badly and hoped so deeply, that he would be there. But Jesus chose every course of his life with a purpose. The purpose here being that his disciples and the rest of the world would learn a lesson about the power of faith and that God would have glory and praise. Jesus was constantly on the lookout for times when he could convert, that he could convert to learning moments for these men who were going to take his lessons, apply them to their lives, and explode them across their universe and plant the church. He knew the miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead would have incredibly more impact than simply healing a serious disease. It would indeed deeply impact his disciples. It would also put a few more degrees of torque in the tension that was growing among the religious leaders leading toward the Calvary crescendo that's about to break over the Judean hill country. We need to do a sad bar. Because I told you a few weeks ago, and Michael Grogan reminded me last Wednesday night at the men's Bible study, I told you that opinions, my opinions, don't belong in my sermons. 
And so the only way I can legally give you my opinion on this is to break out of the sermon and give you a sidebar. Okay? So I want to tell you my opinion about why Jesus wept. Some of you saw on Facebook, I asked the question, why did Jesus cry? It really amazes me how much argument grows out of these two simple words, Jesus wept. The shortest verse in the entire Bible, Jesus wept. Why did he cry? There's incredible argument, and <laughs> I've seen where people have tried to build doctrine around it, and I've seen others where they try to use it for a sermon text. I've seen pictures that artists painted. I've seen carvings that sculptures carved of Jesus with tears flowing down his face. And here in all this mourning and weeping and long sad faces and no laughter, the air is thick with the sorrow. And here are the sisters Mary and Martha, his good and trusted friends, who've been grieving for days, and it's his fault. He arrives, and Martha, the outspoken kitchen manager, Martha, she lays it upon him. Oh, Jesus, thanks for taking the time to stop by. If you had come earlier, like three days ago, he would be fine. Now, that's not quite the way she said it, but I think that's what's the attitude. You could have healed him. Now he's dead and rotting, stinking, and he's gone, and we're alone. Thanks for coming. She doesn't want to talk to him anymore. She walks away and tells Martha, teacher wants to see you. Now it's a double whammy time as Martha, beautiful, soft, and gentle, Martha approaches him and says exactly the same thing. Lord, if you'd only been here, he wouldn't have died. Yes, he could have saved them all this grief by simply coming a few days earlier. Had that happened, they would be having a party, and, and instead they've cried their tear ducts dry, and it's his fault. And on top of that, he feels their pain. If I thought my friends thought that I had let them down, and I knew that they were right in their assumption, I would be remorseful. I would cry. I'd cry with them. And here we see such an incredible aspect of the eternal character of Jesus. We see this part of his humanity. He was fully God, but he was also fully man. And we see this demonstrated so vividly here as he feels the pain of others. He has empathy for them, and it takes him all the way to his tear ducts. He feels our pain, friends. Whatever pain you feel, he shares it. His heart breaks when our hearts break. When we weep, he weeps. This is what makes him such an awesome high priest. As our intercessor before God, he feels our pain. But today, we're really supposed to be thinking of the line, I am the resurrection and the life. You see, this story isn't really about Lazarus or Mary and Martha. They're just the vehicles that carry the story. The story is that in Christ, death is defeated. That the citizens of heaven's kingdom not only have an incredible life of relationship with God in the here and now, but we have an eternity with him. I hope that many of you did your homework this week and memorized the 23rd Psalm in your heart language. And the last line of David's immortal words fit right here. I shall live in the house of the Lord forever. That's now, that's later. His people, us, we have the right of access, the right of residence, the rights of family, the right and the promise of resurrection. Now, I have no evidence to support what I'm about to say, so I guess you could call it another opinion. It's going to be a stretch of our imaginations, but I think that when the religious leaders sat to discuss the Jesus problem, and when they decided... Later in this chapter, the portion we didn't read, I hope you read it later. But when they decided, indeed, that he needed to die, that they were going to have him terminated, I think there was a rising young star in the room, a man who would someday become infamous for his attacks on the nascent church. His name was Saul. 
Years later, he would personally encounter the resurrected Christ, and then more years later, he would write these words that reach across the years to us. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. And then, verse 16, from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, although God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on God's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And then in Romans chapter 6, we're therefore buried with him through baptism unto death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For we have been united with him. For if we have been united with him in a death like this, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Colossians chapter 2. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him, Though through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive in Christ. He forgave all our sins. Having canceled out the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he's taken it away, nailing it to the cross. In Romans 6, again. If we've been united with him in death like this, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. And the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the, na the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. And one last passage and we're almost done. John chapter 10. I've come that they might have life and have it to the full. I believe that Jesus, the resurrection and the life has through his life, through his death, and through his resurrection, he has opened eternity for us. Man, by his own bad behavior, isolated himself, separated himself, shut himself off from God. But God had a plan whose name is Jesus to bring us to eternal life, to destroy death, to destroy sickness, to endow us with resurrection life. And that life is absolutely abundant. 
Would you bow your heads with me? Father, afresh and anew today, we receive that life, the life that you want us to have, a life that's abundant in grace and glory now, a life that's abundant forever, and afresh, and for some of us, a brand new experience. We receive that life today, and we ask you to glorify yourself in us. Help us to become everything you want us to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.